Well, good evening, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started with tonight's presentation. My name is Amber Barnes, and I work for the Woodlands Township Environmental Services Department, and we are hosting this evening's Walk in the Woods Nature Lecture Series. Our department does have a variety of events and programs that are coming up in the next several weeks, which can all be found on our website, which is www.thewoodlandstownship-tx.gov slash environment. I will be sure and put that address in the chat feature for all of you. Um, in addition to upcoming events and programs, this department is a community resource on recycling and solid waste services, mosquito surveillance, sustainable gardening, and water conservation. I'm going to put our contact information in the chat feature, so please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Before we begin the program, I'd like to remind everyone to mute their microphone during Abby's presentation and use a chat feature to submit your questions. After Abby gives her presentation, we'll address any of those questions that are left in the chat feature. So let's get started by introducing our presenter for this evening. Let me pull this over here for just a second. All right. So Abby is from Lubbock, Texas. For her undergraduate degree, she went out to Texas A&M University out in College Station and received her BS in microbiology with an emphasis in evolutionary ecology and a BS in wildlife and fishery sciences with an emphasis on conservation biology. She then worked for two years as a wildlife technician, catching snakes, birds, tortoises, and then she received um, her position as a wildlife biologist looking at bat and bird mortality under large wind turbines. Shortly after meeting her husband in 2016, she decided to go for her master's degree. And the majority of that master's work was done in the coastal estuary regions of the Gulf, catching American alligators, which is why she is here presenting for us this evening. She analyzed their parasitic gut fauna, and she led a field team that caught alligators and really um, reaffirmed her passion for field work and herpetofauna. She graduated with her master's from Texas Tech University um, just recently in May 2020, and her husband recently moved to the Conroe area where they have bought some land. And you can find Abby out at Nature's Way Resources. She works in the nursery area and she does lead a bunch of educational talks out at that facility. So Abby can be found locally. And tonight she is going to be talking to us all about alligators and her fascinating experience out in that estuary. So Abby, I'm gonna turn it over to you Can everybody hear me? I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, hi, my name's Abby, and I'm going to start sharing my screen with our PowerPoint. So just one second. All righty. So like I said, my name's Abby. Um, I thank you so much for the introduction, Amber. That was great. Um, I did my master's in 2020 on alligators and the parasites that live inside them. So that's basically what I'm going to be hitting on today. Um, I also want to talk in general about alligator biology and alligator behavior so that we kind of get to understand North America's largest reptile in depth. Um, that being said, um, in addition to what I, what I do around town, I can be found locally, down here is my business. Um, I recently just started my own business and it's called Living Wild. Um, it's a consultation business for habitat restoration and wildlife friendly gardening. So if you need pollinator patches or hummingbird habitats or just general help with your garden, making it more wildlife friendly, I'm your girl. Um, so this is a little bit about who I am. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, NIPSOT, the Native Plant Society. I'm not their director. Um, I am the editor for the Heartwood Master Naturalist Newsletter, which I love doing. Um, and uh, I do teach classes at Nature's Way Resources. We've done a bug class, we've done bug class, um, butterflies, hummingbirds, and then my favorite was herpetology, um, where we got, you know, kids to see some big snapping turtles and big snakes that are local to our area. So that's kind of neat. Um, so let's jump into alligator Mississippiensis. That is their scientific name. Um, you can see that these guys, they range in size from itty bitty bitty to big, 
monster dudes. Um, so this is their, this bottom picture is their historical range. Back in the 1860s, they were actually um, highly endangered due to overhunting and habitat loss. And right down here, the very like boot heel of Louisiana, um, that's where Rockefeller Wildlife National Refuge is. That's where I did my master's. Um, that refuge itself is the last, it was the last stronghold for American alligators before we started doing population reconstruction with them. So that refuge has 4 million alligators and it's a quarter of the population of the United States. Um, so that refuge is extremely important to us. I have up here that they are apex predators and I want to talk a little bit about what that means in the puzzle piece, in the puzzle of ecology. So at the bottom of the food web, we have our producers, our little bunny rabbits, deer, or I'm sorry, our grass that's growing green. That's the producer. Then we have our little bunny rabbits that come along and eat the grass. That's our first consumer. What keeps the rabbit in check is a higher predator. So let's use the alligator for this example. The alligator keeps rabbit populations in check and rabbit populations keep grass populations in check. That's called top down pressure in environmental sciences. So that top down pressure is really the regulatory beast behind our ecosystems. If we take out the top predator, be it an alligator, be it a coyote, um, mountain lions, any of these apex predators, that top down pressure starts to release. And then we get overabundance of deer or overabundance of rabbits because the ecosystem got out of whack. Um, so they are really important predators. Predators are extremely important to ecosystems and they hold everything together. So it's really important that we understand their ecology and what they actually mean to the ecosystems that they run. Um, it is an indicator species of wetlands. You're not going to see an alligator out in the middle of the desert. So if you see an alligator, if you're near a wetland. Um, and they do contribute to landscape connectivity. The uh, paper resource for that is Sublutsky, oh, 19, nope, 2018. And so they were talking in that paper, they were talking about landscape connectivity of these large animals with this large amount of biomass that they've accumulated from their big pond. When they get up and move to the next pond, all of that energy, all of that nutrients goes with them. So they are actually connecting the landscape nutrient wise, as well as just by walking across the road and going to the next pond. So they are super, super important species that we need to know about. Um, throughout this, I'm going to be talking about the size class designations. Um, below 30 centimeters is a hatchling. Um, and they typically don't have a ton in their stomachs whenever we're looking at what they've been eating. So for my masters, we did not sample um, anything under 30 centimeters. So 30 centimeters to 1.2 meters, that's a juvenile, true a juvenile. Um, 1.2 to 1.8. That's a true subadult. And then this big guy right here, um, that is our 14 and a half foot long alligator. Um, he was the largest guy that we got. So he was really cool. That's my best friend's hand, giving him a high five. So there's something called an ontogenetic shift when alligators, even fish, um, but we're talking about alligators. So as alligators grow, their diet changes drastically. And that means their environment has to change with it. So we take our little hatchling right here and he's less than 30 centimeters. What he's eating is little insects, dragonflies. That's mosquito fish, Gambusia affinis. Um, little shrimp, freshwater shrimp and snails are a huge part of baby, baby alligators diets, hatchling diets. Um, so they actually live in these little nursery type pools that protect them from incoming hurricanes, larger gators, that kind of thing, um, because gators are cannibalistic. So they do stay in these nursery ponds in which all of these, all of these 
prey items can be found pretty easily. Um, I tend to put my, my questions in red at the bottom. So what is happening to the parasite community during these ontogenetic niche shifts? That's something that I want us all to be thinking about. Um, that's all something I want us to be thinking about through this, all right? And we'll get to parasites later, I promise. So this guy then grows into a juvenile alligator. He moves again with the landscape connectivity. He moves to a larger channel, perhaps an estuary, somewhere that the big, big guys are not necessarily at. Um, but he's now starting to move towards food items like your crayfish, your bluegill sunfish. I think that's a long year sunfish. Um, and blue crab. That's quite a bit of their diet is blue crab. Subadults are the next size up. That's 1.2 meters to 1.8 meters. Um, there's a little bit of niche overlap here. So our juveniles and our subadults are both eating these blue crabs quite a bit. So you can make an inference that the parasite community that the blue crab that the blue crab is giving to the juveniles and the subadults is going to be similar. These subadults also are starting to take bigger fish like catfish or carp. Um, here you can see an alligator eating a water snake. Um, there's one eating a bird and of course nutria, which are an invasive species, um, but they, they get eaten by alligators quite frequently. So that's our subadult prey assemblage that they're, they're eating. This is the big guys. So the big guys have drastically changed their, um, their diet. They've drastically changed their foraging habits and they've moved into larger, deeper channels where they can ambush hunt. So here is a picture of a big guy eating a soft shell turtle. Um, this is a picture of an alligator eating a smaller alligator because they are cannibalistic. And then this is a picture of, it's a crocodile. So if you noticed, good job, it's a crocodile. Um, this is a picture of a crocodile eating a, a feral pig. Um, so they do a number on the invasives, the feral pigs, the nutria, that kind of thing. So they are such important predators whenever we're looking at the ecosystem as a whole. Um, and then in case anybody couldn't tell what the difference is, um, this guy's an alligator, that guy's an alligator. Even whenever you're looking at an alligator, only their top teeth are showing like this. When you look at a crocodile, they're a full smile. So you can see top teeth and bottom teeth mixed together. That's really the way to tell. Um, also their snouts are quite a bit different. The alligator kind of looks this, like this big broad boat-like um, snout. And then the crocodile of course is much, much more slender. Um, part, of, part of what I did for my master's was, um, this is chapter one. Uh, what I did was I looked at a method called gastric lavage. And that is basically where we take an alligator, we open its mouth, put a tube down its esophagus, pump it full of water, mix the stomach contents around and tilt it so that everything comes back up the tube and I have a lovely little undergraduate pick through it. So that's me starting this process. This was the first alligator I ever did. Um, and it is a non-lethal method. That's what's so interesting about this is I can, I can tube an alligator and make it regurgitate its meal and I don't kill it. I didn't have to necropsy it. I didn't have to open it up. So it's a really great non-lethal technique. Um, there are minor irritations from the procedure. I think Fitzgerald 1989 um, said that there was about just, just a little bruising in the esophagus was the only thing he found that was like a minor irritation. Um, and so we wanna know how my, we wanna know how efficient this is. So why is this method useful? It's for endangered guys like these. Um, that's a more or less crocodile, American crocodile and saltwater crocodiles, the big guys. So if we have an endangered species that we cannot take any kind of sacrifice of one individual, but we want to see what they're eating, this is a good way to do so. Um, we've, ta we've talked about what would happen if we lost the apex predators. Um, the food chain short term 
would collapse. Um, long term, it would start to be out of bounds. So there is nothing checking any other species below it. So deer would get way overpopulated. It's the same thing that happened in the Yellowstone wolf experiment. Um, they took away the wolves, the elk went out of population bounds, they went nuts um, because they had no predator keeping them in check. And then they actually ate the willows, the baby willows down to the ground and they changed the river ecosystems because the beavers didn't have the baby willows to chew on. So one predator being gone has this cascade effect all throughout, all the way to a beaver in the river that it's affecting. Um, so it's it's far reaching. These um, when we take out apex predators, it is far reaching. This is my study site. I spent two years here. Um, I absolutely love Rockefeller. Um, it's great. There is um, a ton. Of, there's a ton of alligators everywhere you go, and there's fishermen there that feed them, not feed them intentionally, but the alligators take the crab lines. So fishermen fish for crab with chicken legs on a string. And you're going to see some of that later in the presentation. Um, this is just a little bit about field method methodology. We captured um, the alligators by hand at night or by noose. If we, they were small enough, we could catch them by hand. But if they were big, we had to, you know, call them in, make our baby alligator noise. It's arr, arr, arr. pretty good. So um, we call them in like that, and they get really excited coming towards that sound. Um, and once we caught them, we secured them, we measured them, we took their sex um, and any identifying marks. So identifying mark wise, we had a female who had a severe underbite and she had just teeth sticking out from her bottom lip. It was pretty funny. Um, this picture right here, that's a picture of a teeny tiny little alligator penis. Um, you have to actually look in internally to see if they are a male or a female. Once they get really, really big, you can kind of start to look and say, that's, that's a huge alligator. It's probably a male. Um, but at any, any, and that's still not accurate. Um, so you do have to probe them and you will see if this was a girl, you would open her cloaca and then there's nothing there. Um, so if you open it and there's a penis there, it's a guy. Now you know how to sex alligators. So first things first, we catch them, we'd open their mouths. Alligators have a really strong muscle that shuts, but they have a really weak muscle that opens. So you can pull it with your hands open. Um, you just have to be really careful and trust whoever you're working with. Um, so of course I have my best friends with me. And then we carefully place the tube um, a PVC pipe actually into the alligator's mouth and tape it in place so that it's secure. Um, then I run the tube down it, I lube it with vegetable oil and I run the tube down the alligator's esophagus and you have to get past the pyloric sphincter and then you know you're in the stomach. Then you start pouring the water down the tube and we keep the alligator head up so that everything runs down. There's no, no possibility anything gets into his lungs. If I have tubed it right, there's no possibility. Um, and then we, we Heimlich them. We basically take their stomachs and go whoop, 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 and we mix all the stomach contents and we tilt them and it comes back up the tube into a bucket. So we actually, this is our big guy, our 14 foot long guy. We actually had to make a seesaw for him um, built up on bricks and wood and strap him to the board because he was too heavy for us to tilt back and forth. So we tilt him back, we put water in him, and then we Heimlich him. That's this one, that's Bethsaida. She's back there Heimlicking him with quite a bit of force because it takes a bit of force to get the stomach contents mixed. Um, and then out of the tube down here comes the stomach contents, and that's my little buddy Christian who would pick through my stomach contents for his undergraduate degree. He did great. Um, and then I have, I have a really special movie. So one second, it's gonna take me a second to share.
All righty. Can we see this? Amber, can you guys see this? This isn't screen sharing. It's not playing yet, Abby. Okay, okay, cool. But you can see it. Okay, so this is us doing the big guy. Um, this is Sergio with the top jaw rope. You have to be really strong to, to hold it open because they just want to shut their mouth anytime they feel anything in their mouth. Um, and then down here is Andres, and he's on the bottom jaw rope, and he lets go at one point and gets in trouble. Um, but my problem is I couldn't get it past the bottom jaw rope, so it takes a little bit. And you can see right when he clamps down, the PVC pipe flexes. It's very, he's very strong. Abby, that might be something I have you, can you open it in a different screen? I don't think it, it played for all of our viewers. Okay, let me see here. Great description though, very descriptive. <laughs> Let's see. Mm -hmm. It's this one. Let's download it. I do apologize for this. Not a problem. We are good on time, Abby. Trying to get it to download. Okay, what if I share this? We can see that, that looks good. Okay, let's try this. Of course it's gonna buffer. Ugh. So that's, that's the video. Um, it is pretty fun to have your hands on a wild alligator. Um, let me start sharing this guy. Alrighty. So it is really fun having your hands on a wild alligator. And they are so strong and they really are dinosaurs. So it's very cool. Um, so this is, this is actually what we got out of the stomachs. So um, let me preface this by saying, while it is a non-lethal technique, in order for me to test the efficiency of the flush, I had to sacrifice the animals that I caught. Um, that's not too big of a deal, um, just in that, one second. It's just gonna keep playing for me. Let's try one more time. Okay, 
So I did have to kill the animals that I caught. Um, this was not a big deal because the refuge itself, I mean, it was a big deal to me. I hate killing things. Um, so it was a big deal to me. But to the refuge, they cull 22,000 alligators every year just to keep the population in balance. Um, so I took 108. That was not um, anything significant that would have thrown the population off. And they counted that within their, their 22,000 cull. So essentially I got to use those alligators before they culled them. Um, so this is the chicken wire that I was talking about. So this is an actual stomach that we necropsied after the alligator was dispatched. Um, we necropsied all the stomachs so that we could compare what we got in the flesh versus what was left in the stomach. And that gave us our efficiency. You can see it'd be really difficult to get this out through that tube. So if they have all this anthropogenic trash that's riding around in their stomach, this effectiveness is way low. It's so low that we can't even really use it to see what they're eating. Um, same thing over here. It's You can see here, there's a bobber, a, a fishing bobber right there and a big hook. And it looks like some, some vertebrae, maybe some chicken bones because it's hollow. Um, that's what didn't come up through the tube. So on big guys, and we'll get to this, but on big guys, the flush efficiency didn't do so well. Um, it did reek. It smelled pretty bad. Um, so bad that I got kicked out of our lab and made to finish my um, dissections on the roof of the biology building. So that was fun. Um, here's a couple of just stats and math that I did. It was pretty simple math. Um, and then the stats was just to show me um, if what I'm seeing is that a pattern or if it's actually significant. Um, so my p-value, uh, for those of you who like to look at p-values, um, was really low. So there is this quite a big significant difference between the juveniles, the subadults, and the adults flush efficiency. So this, this table right here is saying I caught 34 juveniles. Um, they flushed at about 60% efficient. So we got 60% of whatever they're eating out. Subadults is pretty low at 32%. And then the adults is even lower at 25% of stomach contents being regurgitated in the flush. Um, so that's pretty interesting. This is a really nice graphic that just shows how as the alligator gets larger, there is um, less and less amount of stomach contents prey assemblage that we get from them. We do have two outliers. Um, we don't know if maybe these guys were not ingested with, um, just, I'm sorry, not congested with crab line and they had everything flow out very nicely because we got almost 70 and 60% on an alligator that's over two meters. So that was good. Um, if we can figure out how to replicate these or maybe sample animals that are not so close to humans, we may get a better flush efficiency. Yeah. Um, just a little bit of a discussion. That's, that's the refuge at night. Um, the clear plastic tubing was the biasing factor. Um, it, a turtle shell, like you saw the big guy eating, a turtle shell, no matter how crunched up it is, is not really going to come up a tube. So on bigger animals, it's not that good of a technique. But on smaller animals, it's a really good technique. Um, these are again two big, big animals that got flushed. This was after three flushings. Each animal got three flushes. Um, the flush efficiency on this guy was 3.52% and even lower down here on 1.76%. But you can see this big metal fishing line. There is a bobber. Um, the hooks, they're, they're not going to come up in the, in the flush. So the anthropomorphic ingesta was a big problem. Um, here's my conclusions, you know, just it's an, it really is an unreliable snapshot of the American alligators diet, especially the larger they get. Um, and then I move into chapter two, which is all about the parasites. So after I flushed the 
alligators and we picked through their ingesta and then we, um, we took out the parasites. And my hypothesis was that if a juvenile alligator, a very small alligator is eating bugs, snails, small fish, that is the parasite community assemblage that they're going to have. And I predict that it would be different among size classes. So that's the hypothesis that I was testing. Um, I chose to do nematodes because they're big. I could see them with my, with my bare eye. Um, and we actually know quite a bit about nematodes. We also know that nematode um, parasitism is not sex specific in alligators. So I'm not gonna bias myself by saying male alligators have more parasites than female alligators. That's not right. It's just flat across the board, everybody's equal. Um, and then of course the broadening of prey selection as they get bigger, they switch their ontogenetic niche. Um, that's going to bring in a broader array of parasites. Um, so really it was do the host changes in dietary habits impact the gastric nematode community. Um, there's some little nematodes right there. So after our stomach samples were weighed and the parasites were dissected and rehydrated, um, they were counted and identified to morphotypes. And I'll talk more about that. Um, but interestingly, in parasitology and in ecology, there is kind of this conundrum of when an individual is within an ecosystem, where does its boundaries stop? Where does its interaction stop? So we think about the wolves of Yellowstone, their interactions didn't stop with the elks, it stopped all the way down the line with beavers. With parasites, we have a really nice closed system because their interaction is the host, it's confined within the host. So that's just one really interesting bit about parasitology that allows us to study ecosystems in a way we couldn't study them otherwise. Um, this is what I used to kind of um, decide which species were which. So I had to look under a dissecting microscope and I had to see, you know, these, these little suckers, that species specific, the genitalia are in the ornamentation on the tail is very species specific. Um, so from that, I was able to differentiate different morpho species. Um, these are some of the statistics that I used. Um, pretty, pretty basic statistics, nothing too crazy. Um, I left this up for any stats nerds who want to look. Um, and then the results. So out of the um, 47 infected alligators, alligators are very healthy. So the 108 that I caught, only 47 of them had parasites in them. So they are quite healthy. Um, a total of 744 were found. So if we look at juveniles, they're finding total about 78 per class size. Um, Subadults, we got 258 per class size for like total subadults. And then the adults had 408 um, parasites. So the, if you look at the Shannon's diversity index, the closer it gets to one, is um, the higher diversity. So at when we're sitting here at 0.75, we're looking at a high diversity of, of parasites, but we go down here to 0.42 and it's a lower parasite diversity. Um, this is just a nice graphic of showing who, who had parasites and how many. So if it was truly what I said, it would kind of swoop up like this. Um, but instead we have some outliers, you know, we had one juvenile who had four different species um, and that was, that was rare. Then we have starting in sub adults, you at least have three most of the time, except for these guys. So it, it kind of, it kind of differs on, on size for sure, but it also differs on the prey items that they're eating. So nematode diversity positively correlates with alligator size. The factors apparent, uh, affecting these parasite community structures are the consumption rates. The bigger alligators are shoving more down their gullet, so they're gonna get more parasites. 
They're also eating a larger diversity of prey because they can, they can hunt that large diversity of prey. Um, and then vertical transmission is when it, it happens strictly in cannibalism. So if this big guy, this big guy had this guy, little guy as a meal, all the parasites that are in his stomach are about to end up in his stomach. That's vertical transmission. So that could be another reason why we saw a higher diversity and a higher number of parasites in big guys. Um, the other thing is they could be peritonic hosts. So the one weird outlier that we saw here, he could have picked up, um, or even here, he could have picked up a prey item that he normally doesn't eat and gotten sick with the pair or infected with the parasites that that prey item typically carries, even though the alligator is not the end host. Um, and then this was an interesting, and it was an interesting study that I came across um, because it really did kind of hit the nail on the head of rural alligators um, harbor more parasites than their urban counterparts. Why? Well, it's because the ecosystem is intact. They, that rural alligator is out there living away from humans, not competing with humans for food or space. And so they can really utilize the whole range of their diet versus living in a stock pond in the middle of a suburban area. You get the occasional cat. That's the kind of diversity that you're looking at with urban alligators versus rural alligators. Um, so that's, that's just kind of something to uh, think about. Um, does anybody have any questions? That, that was the end of it. So I, I want your questions. We do have a few questions, Abby. Let me pull those up in the chat feature here. So one of our questions was, um, can you share what motivates alligators to move from one body to another? Yes, that's a great question. So um, they can move once they've run out of food, run out of space. Um, the big guys, they can go looking for mates. Um, they also will kind of all congregate together in these big mating pools. And typically they're solitary. So they would have to come and travel to those mating pools. Um, alligators, they, they do just move around. You'll see them if you go on um, roads in Louisiana, they're out basking on the roads. Um, now, if they go on that side or that side, that's two different channels. So they, they are connecting the habitat, but the, what, what drives them to move is a number of different things. Wonderful. And then we do have a few more questions. And if any of you who are listening have a question for Abby, just be sure and type it into the chat feature and we'll address that. So the next question, Abby, is the trash, the, the string, the bobbers, everything that you showed us in those photos, does that typically pass out of the alligator or does it stay in its stomach for life? It stays in its stomach for life. Yeah. Um, we were catching alligators. I actually have, have a couple of things. We were actually catching alligators, big guys that had these tags in their stomachs. And that's a toe tag from a baby alligator. And on this one, it said it was tagged in 1988, and I caught that alligator in, in uh, 2019. Yeah, and that, that's just a little piece of metal. So you can imagine what, what, those are, what those alligators are going through. It's not pleasant, it can't be pleasant. Were you able to interpret how all of that, um, that they're unable to pass, does it have a, I'm guessing there's a long-term effect on how long those alligators can live healthy lives. Does, does she have any information to share on, um, does it lead to um, so a shorter lifespan? It, it, it can lead to a decreased body condition. Um, but in reality, alligators, I, I had said earlier, they're, they're quite healthy and they're really good at shuttling bad things away. So what I mean by that is if you eat an alligator that has, um, that's not been farmed, you eat an alligator that someone's caught from a bayou, you've probably had your lifetime um, dosage of mercury and lead. 
because alligators are really good at sequestering those uh, heavy metals into their system to where they don't use, they don't, it's not in their body where they're using it all the time. Females will actually shed the heavy metal toxicants that I'm sure come from our environment, pollution, the, the fish hooks they're eating. Um, they shed that in eggs because they know they can get rid of the bad stuff if they put it in the eggshell, but it also makes the eggs more brittle. It's, it's not a good problem. Um, I don't know what problem is good, but it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to say. Um, I don't think that it's killing them by any means, but I do think that it has an impact on their body condition. And, and that's just a great reminder. Those photos really drive home the message of the impact that we have on our environment and how it really does affect wildlife, um, even beyond what we may think it does. Um, those, those are really wonderful photos to share. Uh, we do have a few additional questions. Um, do alligators have permanent territories that they protect or are they kind of continually moving? Um, the big guys, yes. The big male alligators have territories that they will protect. Um, what would make them move is they get kicked out by a bigger guy or um, habitat loss. Somebody could come in and drain their pond and they've got to move. Um, so that would be one reason to give up a territory. The, the female alligators are not so territorial. They're much more focused, their territoriality comes from protecting the nests. So it's not so much, this is my pond, it's don't come near my nest or I'll bite you. Thanks, Abby. Uh, back to stomach related questions. Do alligators or crocodiles have a larger stomach? Um, the bigger the animal, the bigger the stomach. Anatomically, they're both very similar. Um, if I had to air a guess, it'd probably be crocs because of what they eat. Um, being out in the ocean and being um, really aggressive, really aggressive. I mean, compared to an alligator, alligators are like dogs compared to a crocodile. I mean, crocodiles will chase you. Um, so thankfully we don't, we don't have any in, um, in the United States, we used to, we used to have the American um, crocodile, but now it is restricted to Cuba. Occasionally comes over into Florida. Well, that leads to, um, that's a perfect lead up to another question. Someone asked, what is the more aggressive species between alligators? There's only one species of alligator that we have in North America. Um, and they are by, other, by, by crocodilian standards, they are not aggressive. Um, if that's, that being said, if you find a mom protecting her nest, she's going to protect it. She's going to be aggressive. Um, I have seen, the other thing that's interesting is alligators, anatomically speaking, they can, they can push up and walk, but they can't gallop. And I'm sure you guys have seen crocodiles galloping either at Steve Irwin or on the Discovery Channel, they gallop. Um, alligators can't, they don't have that, that joint structure to move like that. Um, and that's to me why crocodiles are so much scarier is because they're so much faster on land. Yeah, but we do have a Chinese alligator um, and they're not, they're not aggressive. Alligators in general, alligators, caimans, not, not so aggressive, but crocs are quite aggressive. So is there anywhere locally that you like to go and see alligators? Yes, I love going to Brazos Bend State Park. They have a great population there and the alligators respond to my calls. So they will like swim right up to the deck and I get to see them. Um, yeah, Brazos Bend is great. And then there's, um, gosh, you know, if you go east and you find a pond, chances are there's gonna be some alligators there. 
Um, the further closer we get to Louisiana, the higher the alligator population density goes up. I've even seen them up in Tyler, Texas. Um, so they, they are around for sure. I think there's a bayou in Houston that has them, but I, the name for, slips me right now. And Brazos Bend is just right down the road. So for those of you who aren't familiar, I would definitely recommend that you check it out. It's a wonderful state park. Uh, we do have just a few more questions, Abby. Um, so you um, talked about culling the alligators because um, they had that high population. So one of our questions is asking, is it beneficial to cull other species, red-eared turtles, for example, that don't seem to have predators in our neighborhood ponds? Right, so yes. Culling is a wildlife management technique that we use to keep populations in check. When you don't have predators in your neighborhood ponds, um, the red-eared sliders are gonna go berserk. There is gonna be a time that they hit carrying capacity. And so when, when a species hits carrying capacity, it's more that they lose the amount of food that can sustain that population level. So the population goes down without a predator. Um, or they migrate off so that that population within that pond stays around carrying capacity. It oscillates up and down just right around the line for carrying capacity. Um, it is beneficial to cull things. Um, you have to really know what you're doing though. So the big CWD scares, chronic wasting disease, that is a big deal in um, central Texas and it's really a big deal everywhere. Um, but they are culling huge herds of deer because two or three deer have come up positive for CWD. Um, that can be detrimental to an ecosystem, but so can CWD. We're kind of in a rock and a hard place there, but ponds and turtles, yeah, they should be maybe culled. I'm not saying you go out and do it. I'm saying alert your next, your like, friendly wildlife biologist so she can go out and fix the problem. That's a great point to bring up, Abby. So um, for anyone who's noticing an overpopulation of any wildlife, the Woodlands Township would direct you to contact our local Texas Parks and Wildlife um, Department. So they do have rangers who monitor wildlife in the communities, especially in urban communities. So if you're noticing an uptick in wildlife, um, you can always contact the Woodlands Township and report it. And um, we're happy to give you the information of who specifically to report those issues to, or um, help you if you're having an instance maybe with um, a nuisance pest. Um, if you're having a lot of wildlife problems on your own property, then we can give you guidance on how to handle that. Um, and, and likely the reason that you're seeing more wildlife um, on your property is because maybe you've got a food source or shelter, or they found something that is attracting them there. And um, like Abby said, it's, it's important to find balance in those populations. So we would definitely be able to direct you all to some great resources. Um, Abby, we have one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Somebody wanted to know if you're familiar with what the population density of alligators are in the Houston area. It's nowhere like Louisiana. Um, I don't have a number, but I think in the state of Texas, we probably have at least half a million. Yeah. Well, then there's a good chance um, if you haven't seen one, you probably will sometime, right? You will. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Abby, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, it definitely me. opened our eyes to a side of alligators and um, their lifestyle, their food, their uh, parasitic uh, balance. And it's been very, very interesting. Um, I'm so happy that you guys liked it. Wonderful. And then don't forget, Abby is out at Nature's Way Resource and she does have her new business, Living Wild. So I will be sending out information to everyone who registered for tonight's program with her contact information if you need to reach out to her and please feel free to pass along any comments in the chat feature before you guys leave be happy to share those with abby abby thank you very much you have a thank wonderful you. evening thank you